So we talked about the blood vessels in the cerebral cortex. Now let's talk about what can go wrong. Our first topic is going to be on ischemia. Ischemia. We glanced over it. We talked about how you can have things like global hypotension. What area does that affect? That'd be your watershed zone. We also talked about you can have thrombosis. So right, global hypotension. And we said that was your watershed zones. You get those wedge-shaped infarcts. Those are the areas between your, your artery supplies. So watershed zones. We said thrombosis. which seems to be most commonly seen in your MCA. Why is that? Well, if we redraw our circle willis, so you had your internal carotids, and that became your MCA, and your ACA, your anterior cerebral artery. And then you also have your vertebral arteries that fuse together and make your basilar artery. That branched off to your PCA. Now that was your cerebral willis. Well, one of the proposed mechanisms for why thrombosis is more common in your MCA is um, you have atherosclerosis. Because atherosclerosis likes to hit common areas like your abdominal aorta, your popliteal, your coronary artery, and your internal carotids. Your internal carotids. And atherosclerosis can cause thrombosis, blood clots. And so it just seems natural that if it affects your internal carotid, it will more likely affect your MCA because it's more of a direct connection. Just, but just know for your intents and purposes, thrombosis is more commonly seen in your MCA. You can also have embolus. How does an embolus get into your arterial system? Well, it can drain from your venous system, and if you have a patent foramen ovella, then it can go to your arterial system. You throw it off into your circle of willis, and you can have an embolus there. So all of this can cause ischemia. They might ask you what area of the brain is more susceptible to ischemia. That'd be your hippocampus. Why is that? I'm not quite sure. There just seems to be a higher ATP use in your hippocampus for whatever reason. Maybe it's very, very important, but just know hippocampus is a big one. I've gotten a few questions on that, so it is the most susceptible area for ischemia. Now, any ischemia for more than five minutes leads to irreversible damage. Yeah, irreversible, irreversible because um, our neural cells they're permanent cells. So we talked about Wallerian degeneration as a mechanism of how it can preserve itself, but usually it's irreversible. Yeah. Now there's different severities of ischemia. Let's say you have a very mild ischemia. You have a very small thrombosis that gives you a little bit of ischemia, but then you kind of clear the thrombosis. And so you have maybe like a minute of ischemia and your brain kind of freaks out and you show these symptoms. Yeah, so if you have these symptoms, this, these neural deficits, and they last less than 24 hours, there's no MI, MRI change seen in the brain, so I'll write negative MRI change, and it's reversible. We call this just a mild attack or a transient ischemic attack, TIA. Now, if it's less than mild, if it's more severe, then we call that an ischemic stroke. And signs of ischemic strokes are pretty clear. We talked about earlier, if your ACA is stroked out, if it's undergoing ischemia, then you'll have things like lower limb deficits. If your MCA, which supplies your lateral side, has a stroke, then you'll have facial and upper limb deficits. So ischemic stroke um, signs in the question system are very easy to pick up. And then they might ask you what you're gonna do about it. You're not gonna do an MRI, you're gonna do a non-contrast C. T. Why is that? An MRI can pick up ischemic changes in three minutes. A non-contrast CT picks up ischemic changes in six hours. Why would we use this then? Because we're not looking for ischemic changes. We're looking for hemorrhagic changes. The reason why we're looking for hemorrhagic changes is because the treatment for ischemic stroke is TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. And this turns plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin is the biggest enzyme we have that helps break down clots. And so we can break down this clot and stop the ischemia. However, if there's a hemorrhagic stroke and we get TPA, we'll just bleed out more. So we're not looking for ischemic changes. We're just trying to rule out hemorrhagic changes. And if you rule out hemorrhagic changes, then it's an ischemic stroke, right? We want to do it as soon as possible because you can only give TPA within three to four and a half hours of the stroke.
The evidence shows that if you give it later, it doesn't really help. Now, what do you find on histo? Well, histo, one of the first signs is that your neurons will die, neuron death. And on histo, they look kind of red. They don't actually turn red, they just don't stain as well. So they look red, we call these red neurons. So just red neurons, then after which you'll start to see the necrosis. And neutrophils will come in and try and clean it up. Your macrophages will come and clean it up. What do we call the macrophages of your CNS? We call those microglial cells. Good. About a week later, your support cells will proliferate, try and support the remaining neurons. What do we call that? We call that gliosis. Gliosis. And then after which you can see the lasting scar of where there was damage. So those are your ischemic stroke findings. In the classical physical findings, we talked about how you can have like upper limb deficits or lower limb deficits, but those are your major arteries. How about your smaller arteries? How about your lenticulostriate arteries? Ah, where do we say these came from again? Came from your MCA. These are these small penetrating arteries that go deep into your brain. So this right deep. And this applies to deep structures of your brain. Now, strokes of these arteries are a little less common. They're more commonly ruptured through aneurysms or hypertension. They're very small, very fragile, so hypertension or aneurysms can just cause them to rupture. But you can't have strokes. And when you have ischemic strokes, then the blood supply stops and the area that it surrounds, then and the area that it supplies will start to die. You'll, stay, you'll see these little cavities, these little lakes of necrosis, lakes. And the fancy word for lakes is just lacunar. So sometimes you call these lacunar strokes. These little cavities deep, deep, deep in the brain, because it's deep in the brain, you know you're talking about lenticular striate, deep in the brain, these little cavities, lenticular striate strokes. And because it supplies deep areas of the brain, we're gonna be talking about things like internal capsule, and thalamus, these deep internal structures. Your internal capsule plays a huge role in your basal ganglia. So if you have a stroke in this, you're gonna have pair motor deficits. Important you know that. Your thalamus helps relay all motor and sensory information. Basically, your thalamus is incredibly important. However, clinically, if you have a stroke in your thalamus, they show up as pure sensory I've gotten a ton of questions on this. A peer sensory stroke is a thalamic stroke. A peer motor stroke is an internal capsule stroke. Very, very important, you know that? And the history and the question stem will give it away, as long as you know these facts. Something else you should know. Strokes of your thalamus can lead to something called central post stroke pain. <laughs> what do you think that is? It messes with your sensory system so much that you get post-stroke pain. So even after the stroke has resolved, you just, get this, you just get this lasting neuropathic pain in whatever areas that's affected. Okay, so central post-stroke pain. All right, now that was ischemia. Let's talk about the opposite. How about hemorrhage, where you're just bleeding out? This is gonna be caused by a blood vessel bursting like from hypertension, or you can have a trauma related incidence where you basically physically break the vessel. If you have like a car crash and you just smash your head into something, you can have trauma that way. So that's right, trauma. Whatever the case is, you're, you're bleeding out. You're having hemorrhage of these vessels. Now that blood has to go somewhere, it has to collect in some sort of space. And to find out what spaces that the blood can collect in, let's just review our meninges. We just talked about this last video, so hopefully it's still fresh in your mind. Remember, your meninges are a protective layer over your brain. So this is your brain, and this is your bone. Then the first layer of your meninges is your dura mater. We say your dura mater is made up of two layers. This kind of looks like this. And then in between, we said it has your sinuses, your dural sinuses. Dural venous sinuses. Next is your arachnoid. And we said that the area beneath your arachnoid, called your subarachnoid, subarachnoid, 
And in this space, in this subarachnoid space, is where you have your blood vessels and your CSF that helps, that drains into your dura sinuses via arachnoid granulations. And the last but not least is your pia mater. And that is your meninges. So what are some spaces where blood can collect? Well, it can collect above your dura, in between your dura and your skull, we call that epidural. Epidural, or above the dura. It can collect below the dura, or subdural. It can collect below the arachnoid, in the subarachnoid space, we call that subarachnoid. And then it can collect in the brain itself. We call that intraparenchymal, basically inside the brain matter. We'll talk about epidural hemorrhages first. So epidural hemorrhages can occur because there's a blood vessel in this space between your dura and your skull called the middle meningeal. And there's a branch of the maxillary. And because of its superficial nature, if you have a skull fracture or any trauma, you can rupture this artery. Now your dura attaches to your skull and it's a very, very tight attachment. If you've ever seen someone peel dura off the skull, it is very, very tight. You have to like really crank it. It's just smack dab on there. And you have sutures, right? Sutures of your skull. And in those sutures, your dura will kind of lock in, okay? So the only thing that can separate this tight, tight dura from your skull is arterial pressure, so your middle meningeal artery. So if you break that artery, then that blood will just rush in between the layers and rip it apart. As blood flows through here and rips that dura away from your skull, you get lucid intervals. You basically just pass out and then you kind of, kind of regain yourself and then you pass out again and you kind of regain yourself. Why is that? Well, when you have blood seeping through and just ripping the dura, you're gonna rip a spot and then you're gonna pass out. And that blood will start to accumulate and you'll kind of recover and recover and then, but that pressure will keep building and building and building until you rip some more and then you'll pass out. So you have these areas of kind of ripping and areas of kind of blood accumulation in between. Another example would be if I had a shirt with buttons on it and I pulled on my collar and I pulled and pulled and pulled until a button popped. Yeah? And then I kept pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling until another button popped. So you have these intervals of basically ripping and blood accumulation. That's what causes the lucid intervals. And it'll keep on ripping your dura until it hits those suture lines. Because your dura is nailed into the suture line and it can't rip any further. So what it looks like on imaging is it'll look like this, where blood accumulates and it's stopped by the suture line. We can usually call this a lens-like. And it does not cross suture lines not cross suture lines. You can imagine this giant mass of blood will push your brain and smash your brain to oblivion. So you can have areas of your brain herniating out. In particular, you can have a trans tentorial herniation. We're gonna talk about herniations in future videos. Just keep this locked in the back of your mind. So trans tentorial herniations can compress cranial nerves, especially cranial nerve three. So this is all epidural hemorrhages. A subdural would be below the dura, right over here. How can you have a bleed below your dura? Well, your dura venous sinuses also have these veins that go from your venous, they go from your sinuses into your brain. We call these bridging veins. And if these veins snap, then they can bleed into your subdural space. So I'll just write bridging veins. And there's two important things to know about this. One is veins, so it's venous pressure, it's a lower pressure. And two, because it's below the dura, you don't have that, that forceful ripping, so you don't have lucid intervals.
And you also, and also that blood, because it's below the dura, it's not ripping the dura, it doesn't have to respect those suture lines. Yeah? So what you'll see instead is something that looks kind of like this. Where it can cross the suture lines because it's not ripping the dura. When do you see this? Well, you can see this in trauma. You can also see this in brain atrophy. Like in elderly patients or Alzheimer's. In Alzheimer's, your brain will atrophy. So if this brain gets smaller, then it will pull on these bridging veins and cause them to snap a little bit easier. Another more unfortunate thing is you can see it in child abuse. So if you shake a baby, then they'll just rip those veins apart. So I'll just write shaking baby. That's a lot of info. How can we synthesize that into a step-by question? Shaking baby, it'll talk about some child that comes in with lots of fractures, lots of bruising, retinal hemorrhages. Imaging that looks like this, this crescentic hematoma, and then they might ask what happened, child abuse, or they might ask what blood sub what veins were destroyed, maybe your bridging veins. Alzheimer's we'll talk about in a future video, but that's how they can ask um, subdural hematomas and shaking baby syndrome. Subarachnoid. We say your subarachnoid space is where your are your arteries are, your circle of willis. So circle of willis. It's pretty deep in your skull, so trauma is not very likely. Instead, aneurysms can cause it to burst and bleed. Sometimes you can also have AV malformation, so abnormal vessel malformations. And that can cause us to burst and bleed. Imaging will always, always show blood on the bottom of the skull. Why is it on the bottom of the skull? Because that's where your circle willis is. We said your circle willis is on the base of your skull, correct? So nothing else really shows blood on the base of your skull. If they show you a picture, they're basically giving it away. So blood on the base of the skull, subarachnoid hemorrhage. History, we'll talk about an acute sudden headache. A headache that just floors you, it's so severe. So acute headache, worst headache you can imagine. And it's from these aneurysms popping. Now I just wanna talk about the aneurysms in a little bit more detail. So aneurysm is just an outpouching of your blood vessels. And it contains all three layers of your blood vessels. So if we draw your circle again, you have your MCA, your ACA, and your PCA. Aneurysms can affect your circle of Willis, mainly in your junction spot. So usually between your ACA and your anterior communicating. These junction spots are a little bit weaker, so they can cause that outpouching, that aneurysm. But they can be anywhere, really. They can affect your ACA, and that can cause problems with ACA distribution. Your ACA is also located near your optic chiasm. So you can have optic chiasm problems. It can affect your MCA. MCA is simple, it just affects your MCA distribution. It can affect your PCA. Near your PCA, you have cranial nerve three. So PCA aneurysms can compress on that cranial nerve three. So many things just affect cranial nerve three. So that's just another one you have to remember. So PCA aneurysms, and they can grow and grow and grow until they burst. And then you get that sudden onset headache and they will come in and then you can do a spinal tap, drain the spinal fluid and you'll see blood in the spinal fluid as you can imagine. So spinal fluid, blood or it can be yellow from the bilirubin you break down your blood you can release bilirubin and it can turn that spinal fluid yellow fancy word for that is xanthochromic so this is xanthochromic spinal tap they're just trying to make things a little bit more difficult for you they're just talking about subarachnoid hemorrhage okay let's say you had a subarachnoid hemorrhage and you made it through that's not an easy feat, so congrats. However, you're not out of the woods yet. Damaged vessels can spasm. So complication of subarachnoid hemorrhage is basal spasm.
And anytime there's vasospasms, we treat it with calcium channel blockers, kind of releases, relaxes that vessel. And this is no different, so calcium channel blockers. They'll want you to know this. Nimodipine is our biggest one. So a patient will come in with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, survive, is doing fine, and then suddenly deteriorates. And then they might ask you why, due to a vasospasm, or they might ask you what's the treatment, give them a calcium channel blocker. Any vasospasm with your calcium channel blockers, vasospasm of your coronary arteries, aka Prince Metal, a vasospasm of your peripheral arteries, aka Raynaud's, we treat it all with calcium channel blockers. So this is no different. And there's a big complication that you must recognize. Another complication, when you destroy the subarachnoid space, then you can destroy the CSF granulations that help drain CSF. So you can have decreased CSF drainage, which can, which can raise pressure and cause hydrocephalus. So a patient will have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, worst headache of their life, xanthochromic spinal tap, and then survive and then Later they might have, and then later they might come in because they're having really severe headaches, they're having papilloma edema, they're having all these signs of raised ICP, and then they might ask you why? Because your subarachnoid space was just destroyed and you can no longer drain that CSF. Complications you must, must, must know. I just write complications of subarachnoid hemorrhages. Last but not least, intraparenchymal, bleeding within your brain itself. These are gonna be these deep, small arteries of your brain. Can you think of what I'm talking about? Lenticular striae. We said that lenticular striae vessels can have ischemic strokes, but we also said that more commonly they can rupture, especially so things like aneurysms, hypertension, all this good stuff, will just cause bleeding in the brain. And they're very, very small vessels, so they'll have very small aneurysms. You might not even pick up the aneurysm on MRI, but you'll pick up the blood. Once that blood builds, you'll see a blood spot in the in the brain, and you know it's intraparenchymal. So they might show you the brain, and then might show you like a bloody spot, and then ask what vessel's affected, lenticulostriate. Sometimes they'll have a patient that has these recurrent bleeds, Recurrent bleeds, that's not normal. There must be something wrong with the vessels and they might have amyloid deposits in their vessels. So just for amyloid, makes it a little bit more fragile. Or they might have vasculitis, again, affecting the vessel, making it more fragile, making them have an increased risk of these recurrent bleeds. So if they're having recurrent bleeds, then you're thinking something's not right with the vessels and then look for something in the question stem to, to guide you towards that. So that does it for what can go wrong in the blood supply of your cortex. I'm just looking at this as like a huge mess, but that, hopefully that just clears some things up. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.